Hey you, and before we get into hunting a killer in this old story, I want to let you know that this video is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a subscription service that puts you in the detective's seat. Every month, they send you a box of evidence in the case of a fictional crime. Your goal, detective, is to analyze the evidence, eliminate and hone in on suspects, and finally catch the real killer. In the boxes they send you every month, you get reports, audio recordings, videos, photos, which you carefully go through to look for clues, hidden or otherwise. They sent me a season and honestly I enjoyed the hell out of it, staying in, playing it for hours at a time. And if you think you would be interested, please check out huntakiller.com slash that chapter and use code chapter for 20% off your first box. Also, part of the proceeds go to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization that works to bring justice and restoration to cold cases. Pretty relevant to the things we talk about uh, here on this channel. So once again, that's huntakiller.com slash that chapter and use code chapter at checkout for 20% off your first box. Thanks to Hunter Killer, and now let's uh, do exactly that. Hey you and welcome, my name is Mike and in this old video, woof, we got the story of Craig Rideout. It's a messed up one, what happened to him? You think he went to Disneyland? What occurred in Rochester, upstate New York in 2016 was pretty grim, especially when bleach is involved. But the suspects in what happened to Craig Rideout are pretty surprising. Alright, that's enough <laughs> trying to be vague, let's get into it. Craig Rideout was born in 1968, raised in upstate New York near Rochester, with one sister, Robin. After studying economics at college, he met Laura Assam in a Rochester pub. Craig and Laura married in 1993 when he was 27 and she 22. That year, they had their first son, Colin. Craig worked as a clackety clackety programmer for a financial services firm. They would eventually have a total of seven children, and with the pitter-patter of tiny feet and more mouths to feed... <sighs> Jesus, that's... well, it's kind of pretty light there now, you know? They were eventually forced to move into a smaller home, and the finances dwindled even further, and trouble... <sighs> started a brew, my friends. Craig's idea to fix this was to get into some sweet gaming. In the outside world, I am a simple programmer. But in here... I am Falcorn, Defender of the Alliance. Colin, the oldest of Craig and Laura, would later write that his father was abusive, emotionally abusive, while, you know, Craig's sister Robin, who lived nearby, would say he was an extremely devoted father, would never intentionally hurt or frighten his own kids. He loved them to bits. Yeah, this is when the lies, untruths, kind of begin. We can only surmise exactly what happened, but it seems that Laura, for... One reason or another, although we got a pretty good reason which we'll get to, wanted to start to turn her children against their dad. During the summer of 2014, Laura, it seems, had enough. She filed for divorce from Craig and moved in with Paul Tucci, Tucci Tucci, who was a longtime family friend of the Rideouts and Craig's best friend. Nice. Yeah, Paul's wife had recently passed away, so he was moving on up. Him and Laura actually kind of started getting close together because. She was a shoulder for him to cry on, and she wanted out of her own marriage. Though you might imagine this might piss Craig off somewhat, um, his friends and colleagues would say, you know, he was a he was a good man. He he kept his chin up. He uh, he was a very patient guy. You know, always looked on the bright side of life. Though inside, Jesus lads, he was devastated. He was awarded custody of his two youngest children, aged six and twelve. The other children were old enough; they could do what they want. The fact that he was awarded custody also could debunk what I just mentioned about his oldest son calling him abusive. Well, he's not around to tell his side of the story. Colin would side with his mother and move in with Paul and his mother. From 2014 onwards though, when the divorce started filing, Laura and Craig's relationship continued to deteriorate quite a bit. You know, she would just drop the kids off and just kind of run away. She would just show up whenever she wanted. Miss appointments, that kind of thing. And things would get even worse as we move closer to 2016. Now, 
At the beginning of 2016 in January, text messages between Colin and Laura, Mam, and Ola's son, show that they started to try and hatch a plan to get their two oldest daughters to frame Craig somehow. Colin and Laura wanted the two daughters to stage an incident that would show Craig was an abusive parent so that Laura could get custody. They hoped to provoke Craig into dis a display of anger so that they could call the police and, you know, he's violent. Colin sent text messages to his sisters with detailed instructions. Tell them you're afraid your dad is going to kill your younger siblings when he gets home, he wrote. And later he texted, don't hesitate to call 911 if he's ever screaming because that would play well in court. The plan went to shit when this little ploy didn't work to get Craig angry because it seems like he didn't really ever get angry because he was a nice guy. So further into 2016, Laura and Paul Tucci, Tucci Tucci, were planning on moving to North Carolina and they wanted to take, Laura wanted to take the two youngest children with her, the ones Craig had custody of. Craig was not having any of that. One night, during the summer of 2016, Craig was woken up in his townhouse by an intruder who plucked a hair from his arm and stole his house keys and Blackberry, then fled. Craig reported this to 911 but had his suspicions that it was his own son, Colin, that had broken in. My name's Craig Rideout. What happened? I wake up at midnight with a sharp pain in my arm. I jump up. <laughs> this will sound crazy. Uh, a, hood, a hooded black figure, mm -hmm. uh, not a black man, was running out of the room. The reason I have to file a police report mm -hmm. is my black bear, which was taken that night. By July of that summer, Laura and Paul were all packing up, getting ready to jet on down to North Carolina. They had already signed a lease on an apartment. And on the night of July 17th, Robin spoke to her brother Craig for the last time. During that conversation, they spoke about what Alex, the third oldest son, had posted on Facebook. See, Alex had posted publicly on Facebook an email Colin had sent to Craig about a week before, and it went a little something like this. Let my mother, and especially the two youngest children, leave. Notice that every child who is old enough to choose has fled. You are a chronic liar and I am sick of you dragging my mother through this contorted divorce while you abuse the court system to try and retain control over her life. Robin and Craig both found this to be, well, untrue. And Craig, he didn't respond publicly on Facebook, but he was like, you know what, I'm going to bring that up at the next custody hearing because Laura is maybe turning my own children against me. But what was Laura telling her own kids what their dad was like. What did, you know, they believe he, what kind of person did they believe he was? After that call, Robin and Craig agreed to speak together the next day. And when Robin emailed him the next morning, she got no answer. Nothing on the ringer either. Robin had replaced his stolen Blackberry with a prepaid phone. He wasn't picking that up. When she called his workplace, the financial services firm, they read her an email he sent his work the night before. My daughter remains ill. I may not be able to answer the phone as I will probably be taking her to the doctor's office. Robin, upon hearing this, was like, huh, that's weird. Maybe at lunchtime I'll pop by his tennis, see if he's around, see what's up. And when she did, opened the door, and she saw a figure in the kitchen. And she was like, oh, it's Craig. Oh, wait, no, it was Laura, cleaning the countertop. Now, Laura wasn't allowed in Craig's house because of your custody rules and all that kind of shit. She also wasn't like a neat person. Her tidying up was kind of weird. What you doing here, Laura? Where's Craig, the husband you hate? Laura, at this point, apparently said to Robin, I knew it wouldn't be long before someone came looking for him. I don't know where he is. Laura said she was there because the kids Craig had custody of woke up alone in the house. Laura then left, and there was no sign of Craig's car. Robin then snooped around the house, and when she found three pairs of shoes, and he only owned three pairs of shoes, she called 911. Craig Rideout was reported missing. 
my brother has not been answering texts or cell phone calls or emails. And I could be making a mountain out of a molehill. That very same day, 50 miles south of Rochester, a farmer was biking to work early in the morning down a quiet country road. As he was pedaling away, he spotted two cars parked by the side of the road, with two figures nearby. Three hours later, as he was biking back, the figures and the cars were gone, but a shovel remained. Heading over toward it and following a trail of trampled grass into the woods, he found a brown tarp and a bare foot visible underneath. Sheriff's deputies soon arrived. There's a foot there when they heard a ring ring coming from underneath the tarp. Pull up, took out the phone. What was the caller ID saying? Robin. At that very same time, police arrived at Craig's townhouse, where Robin wanted them to force open Craig's locked bedroom door. However, they refused as they needed a warrant to even enter the house. Laura and Paul soon arrived there. Laura said she was tidying up, put things in a basement, but had no idea where Craig was. And when the police eventually did search the house and got a warrant, they opened the locked bedroom and found nothing inside. But when they searched the basement, they found blood splatter on the walls and shelving unit. And inside a bag, they found what appeared to be a garrote. The police were pretty quick to figure out whose body it was under the tarp. After all, they had a phone calling, a phone Craig never mentioned to his soon-to-be ex-wife that he had replaced. Laura did not know anything about this phone, which was interesting when Robin told the police, hey, you know, just a few weeks ago, someone stole Craig's phone, but only a few people know he had it replaced. So the police had a crime scene and a body, but how do you link those two together? The autopsy of Craig was grim. Drain cleaner had been poured all over his face and fingers to prevent identification, though he was successfully identified due to dental records. It appeared he had been beaten and garroted. Cell phone records pinged Craig's phone on early July 18th from his home to where he was found, leaving his home at 3.15 a.m. CCTV from businesses along that route showed his vehicle and also Paul Tucci, Touchy Tucci's car, on their way to where he was dumped. The day after Craig ride out, his body was found, the police got a call. Someone said two young men were throwing big black bags into a local pond called the Devil's Bathtub, which is a friggin' awesome name, by the way. When they arrived, the police met Colin and Alex. So what's going on? You and your brother are out for a walk? Yeah, basically, it's... I mean, we were just like out and then suddenly people show up and it's like, well that's... I've never really encountered police before, so it was like... Startling. You've never been in trouble before, right? No, I, I don't really do drugs or drink or really party. I've only... How old are you? I'm 19. I'm doing college next year. Tell me, if you tell me what's in that bag before I see what's in that bag, it'll be better for you. You know, I, I don't know what's what's in the bag. And found in the bags were empty bottles of drain cleaner, gloves, and bloody clothing. So the police asked Alex, What you dumping all this shit in the pond for? He said to them, My mammy told me to. Alex and Colin didn't know Craig's body had been found, so the police asked them what they thought could have happened to their dad, to which they responded, He must have left town, you know, gotten sick of everything, sick of all his kids, and just fucked off. He'd always, you know, he'd always threaten, you know, oh, I could just disappear. Figured he was on the next flight to Mexico. Have you heard anything from him? Well, I, I emailed him last night. I didn't hear from him. I heard from him Monday, um, and he picked up my brother and sister, I think, Tuesday. Like, I've, I've been kind of worried about him for, like, stuff's just been freaking me out. Alex and Colin were then arrested. The police then rocked up to Laura and Paul's house, and she, too, was arrested. Inside Laura and Paul's home, they found Craig's car key, which, you know, uh, not good for them. In connection with this homicide investigation, we're announcing the arrest of Alexander Rideout and Colin Rideout and Laura Rideout. The two brothers, Alexander and Colin, were arraigned in uh, Mendentown Court and charged with 
tampering with evidence of felony. Six weeks later, Paul Tucci, Tucci Tucci, was also arrested. Four people arrested and all four made bail. They were only charged with evidence tampering. The police were still trying to build a case against Laura, Colin, Alex and Paul and figure out what exactly happened to Craig. The police would later find CCTV of Laura, Colin and one of their daughters shopping in a local Walmart. Buying what? A lot of drain cleaner, what else? Come on, that's what you usually buy when you go shopping, right? They need those pipes flowing, baby. The next day, just a few hours before the murder, Laura and Paul were spotted buying a large tarp, bungee cord, and more drain cleaner. Colin was also spotted at a different Walmart, buying a shovel. What the investigators think happened is this. Laura and Paul brought the two youngest kids back to Craig's. They were staying with Laura and Paul. And that night, one of them, possibly both of them, went to speak to Craig about the move to North Carolina. Then, possibly, Laura lured Craig down to his basement, where he was beaten, possibly with a pipe, a hammer, something like that, before being gar garroted. Um, the grotting, though, wasn't very good. It's, you know, only supposed to, like, choke you. This cut his neck and sprayed blood just everywhere. So, this led to a lengthy cleanup. Laura wasn't supposed to be there when Robin arrived, you know, when she arrived looking for Craig and she found Laura cleaning up. Laura was supposed to have been long gone. By that stage, they didn't think it would be as bloody as it was. The police then, thinking, remember Paul's wife, she died, and pretty soon after he got with Laura, they began to suspect if it was possible he poisoned her. Hey, Brett, the late wife of Paul Tucci died in 2014. Her name was Jennifer Tucci. A source close to the Rideout murder investigation told me that a medical expert is taking another look at how she died. When Paul Tucci walked out of the sheriff's office Monday, he knew he was a suspect in the murder of Craig Rideout. What he did not know is that an investigator is looking into how his wife died two and a half years ago. This is a picture of Jennifer Tucci. She is buried in St. Mary's Cemetery in Parenton. It's a modest grave site protected by a wreath and a little Christmas tree. The source says an autopsy in 2014 determined Jennifer Tucci died from complications from alcohol. But after Paul Tucci was arrested in September for tampering with evidence in the Craig Rideout murder, our source says a medical expert was directed to start the process of re-examining tissue left over from Jennifer Tucci's autopsy. She died of liver disease and, is it possible he made it look like liver disease? They wanted to exhume her body, but the medical examiner was satisfied it was natural causes. The trial of Laura, Colin, Alex and Paul then began in the summer of 2017. All four were tried together. All pled not guilty. The prosecution had the CCTV footage, clothing found in the bags at the devil's bathtub, which matched all four of them via DNA, and all four were charged with second-degree murder. The motive, the prosecution said, was simply custody, so Laura and the family could start anew in North Carolina. The defense, however, argued they didn't really have much of a motive, and that, you know, all that stuff on the CCTV that they bought in Walmart, pff, you need all that stuff for moving, come on. Who doesn't need, you know, when you're, when you're moving house, uh, a tarp? Um, a shovel, bungee cord, like a shitload of bottles of Drano, drain, drain cleaner. You need all that stuff, come on. What, do you think you need them, all that stuff for something more sinister? Tch. what's wrong with you? You're crazy. Each member of the accused had their own lawyer, which all attempted to shift blame onto another person. Colin blamed Laura, Laura blamed Colin. I'm innocent, twas me ma, twas me son. I've heard some awful things about Craig and Ray here today in court, and I've heard them during the course of the trial. I've also read any number of letters and heard from Robin Drew on a number of occasions now. And depending upon which side of the aisle you're sitting up there, Craig Rideout was either one of the greatest human beings God ever put on this earth, or awful. 
my life experience tells me that neither one of those is possible. Some of the letters I read on his behalf from people who have known him for a very long time speak very highly. It was evil. It was diabolical. Alexander right up was in the basement, and he was a double pump, very tough as pump. Colin Wright up was in the basement and was in Devil Pond. And was there at the time Craig Rayhoff died. Based upon the blood spatter expert who testified here at the trial. And that same group put Laura Wright up in the basement at the time Craig Rayhoff was killed. This is one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. On July 25th, 2017, Laura and Colin Rideout were convicted of second degree murder and Alex Rideout of tampering with evidence. Paul Tucci, the Tooch, he, he was acquitted for one reason or another. Alex was sentenced to two to eight years and Laura and Colin received the maximum sentence of 25 years to life. Despite Paul being acquitted, uh, the detectives definitely believe he had something to do with what happened to Craig. I think that the jury had to consider, uh, you know, what, what we put on as evidence, and I think that the, they did that, but I, I do think it was incorrect, and particularly with regards to Paul Tucci. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I believe Paul Tucci had a major part in this crime. I think that Paul Tucci you know, without any of the four of them, I think that this crime has far less chance of being successful. So, a lot of people think that somebody of Paul Tucci's size would be capable of doing the murder, whether it's to hit him over the head or to strangle him, and also to carry the body out of that house and drop it off in Yates County. What do you think? Hey, well, very particularly, Laura, Laura Rideout is about 106 pounds. Colin, not a very big guy either. And, and it's going to take more than one person, regardless of, of you know, the size of Colin and Alex, to take that body out. Also, the force needed to, to crack someone's skull is pretty, you know, that's a good amount of force. So, yeah, I would think that, that you could reasonably, uh, you know, draw the conclusion that Paul Tucci had some involvement there. Well, as we went through the evidence and you look at, at what was presented, some of the things that, that were presented um, were the video of, of Laura Rideout and Paul Tucci at the Hudson Ave Walmart uh, just hours prior to the occurrences. And what they're buying there is tarps and acid and bungee cords. The body's ultimately found wrapped in a tarp, that same tarp, with bungee cords, those same bungee cords, and, and, the, and the victim was disfigured with acid, that same acid. So do you think Paul Tucci killed Craig Rideout? I do. Did you kill Craig Rideout or were you involved with the murder? No. I've never, ever stepped foot inside of 135 New Wickham, in, all, in, in any of it. We, we were dropping kids off, picking up kids. I've never even been inside the guy's condo. Where were you the day that he died? Where were you? I was at home. Okay. Do you know who killed Craig Rida? I don't. I, I don't think anyone does. Did Laura? No. Laura was with me at home. She, she was with all of us I mean, at the campfire. She was upstairs. What about Colin? Colin has seen the same thing. He was in the campfire, he was in and out. There's an investigator, his name is David Bolton. He's convinced that you were in the basement um, that day and that you were involved with the murder and that you used an iron to strike Craig right out. Did you do that? No, I've never been inside 135, the Wickham. Why would he say that you were? Why would he say that you did? Maybe David Bolton believes in Santa Claus. I don't know. <sighs> This is evidence that obviously the jury did not get to hear. And he also said he believes that you, and again, the jury did not get to hear this, that you helped to carry Craig Rideout's body out of that basement because Laura and Colin could not have done that on their own. Did you? No. I, I think that's interesting because uh, I've seen all the evidence, and that's a big question that's in there, what evidence. They don't even know he was killed in his basement 100%. But if he was, how did, how did they get him out of there? I don't know, Mythbusters ran a nice episode showing a one person could do it. 
Um, so, so he has his theories, and but it, those are theories, speculations with no basis in fact. Because if they had the fact, we would have heard about it. Uh, why were you buying a tarp of bungee cords and drain cleaner? I think that's pretty much been established. We were moving. Uh, look, it, we had a whole list of things that needed to be purchased um, over the la last couple of days. What do you do when you get a house ready for sale? You have to clean it. You have to, I mean, I have some drawers that need repaired. You have to paint. You, you have uh, things that need to be affixed to the walls. Of, you know, it's interesting, people talking about how to move a piano. I wasn't using the tarp to move the piano. I'm using the tarp to protect the living room floor to paint the ceiling, and it's going to go on the wood pile down in North Carolina. The bungee cords are for the foosball table. They're for the arcade game and all of that, and I put those in there. I have teenage girls with long blonde hair and long brown hair that clog up every, ba every bathtub and bathroom sink. One jug of, of, of... Strange case filled with serendipitous moments. I mean, what if the farmer hadn't seen the shovel there by the side of the road, you know? Because it was like 50 feet past that into the forest that Craig's body was. What if, um, you know, the, the whoever, whatever witness reported seeing Colin and Alex throw shit into the devil's bathtub, what if they didn't, you know, report that to the police? What if, um, you know, Colin and Alex weren't idiots and did that at night when no one would see them do it? Alex and Colin told the police during the investigation that they believed their dad had run away, which seems unbelievable. But, you know, it, like I said, serendipitous moments, maybe the police might have believed them if they hadn't, uh, you know, done everything wrong. Poor Craig, you know, who his entire family turned against him and murdered him for, you know, custody? Was there something more that we just don't know? Well, there you have it. That's the ride out. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. I will see you, as always, real soon in the next one. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.